just to introduce me uh, and Maria as well, my name is Thomas Jochen Critchley, and together with Maria Moradas Taylor, we've been convening the Language Teaching Forum since 2015. Uh, to give you a bit of context, the main focus of our work is to uh, stimulate discussion and exchange uh, amongst language practitioners, be it teachers, researchers, scholars, or professionals in the field of languages. And we organize three uh, workshops per year, one per term, basically. Uh, and this year's theme is inter slash transculturality and languages. You can find uh, recordings and materials of past events on our webpage. Uh, and I'll uh, paste, maybe you've seen it already anyway, I'll uh, paste in the chat uh, a link. And especially those who have joined us also last time, the recording of, last, uh, of the last workshop now is, is available together with the PowerPoint as well on our website. So you can browse uh, previous events there. Uh, so, and this brings me uh, to uh, our workshop today. Uh, I'm really uh, very honored to welcome our guest, Karen uh, Rizarher, and I hope I've pronounced it <laughs> more or less uh, understandably. And I, maybe she doesn't need really an introduction, <laughs> but I still uh, try to attempt uh, a brief introduction uh, for those who are maybe not or less familiar with her work. Uh, Karen is a professor emerita in intercultural studies at Roskilde University in Denmark. And she originally actually studied general linguistics and French at the University of Copenhagen uh, and was first uh, appointed to Roskilde University uh, to the interdisciplinary uh, basic studies of the humanities uh, department or section and French and later to international development studies. She was co-initiator and head of the intercultural studies program at Roskilde University. And she was also editor of the area culture and context in the Encyclopedia of Applied Linguistics, which uh, was published in 2012. She's also co-editor of, uh, of the Danish journal Sprog Forum, uh, and uh, you have to forgive me <laughs> the pronunciation, uh, Journal of Language and Culture Pedagogy. Karen, as we, many of you will know, has published widely uh, on the relationships between language and culture in transnational and global perspective, and on the consequences for the intercultural learning of the global citizen. Mm -hmm. Empirical areas researched are the cultural dimensions of foreign language teaching and learning, and of second language learning amongst migrants. A special focus and also some uh, book publications obviously referred to that has been the geopolitical role of textbooks uh, based on critical studies of the representations of the world in textbooks for various languages and used in various contexts. And just to name a few publications, uh, Language and Culture, Global Flows and Local Complexity uh, from 2006, Language and Culture Pedagogy from a National to a Transnational Paradigm in 2007, and the more recent Researching Identity in Interculturality, Interculturality co-edited with Fred Dervin, or Fred Dervin actually, uh, in 2015, and Representations of the World in Language Textbooks, 2018. Uh, so we really are very honored to have such a, uh, an acclaimed and acknowledged and uh, great guest today. And without further ado, I hand over to Karen, who will uh, share her screen and uh, start the workshop. Just one thing, feel free to uh, write questions in the chat whenever you want. We will uh, then read out questions and comments later on uh, in the, uh, when we have moments for discussions. And also a second point, at the end of the talk, uh, we will have 
uh, breakout groups where you can discuss uh, a few questions Karen has prepared for you in smaller groups. And I'll set that up uh, at some point during the talk. So and you will be put into groups of uh, five, six or seven uh, uh, people. Right, so that's everything from uh, me. Uh, I hand over to Karen. Thanks again for coming and over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for this kind uh, presentation. I, I really, uh, I'm really looking forward to to give this uh, talk uh, to all of you who who represent so many languages, and uh, it's really it's it's very very inspiring for me because I well I I really I I try to you know to imagine all your different languages your different uh, perspectives and uh, I'm also looking forward to to the discussion afterwards and uh, now I'll try to look if I can get this to work yes yes <laughs> and then just a moment uh, There is uh, a thing on top which hides my button. Uh, Karen, it's yeah. just above design. Just above design at the top menu. You find the yeah, yes, stuff. That, that, that is covered by. A Oh. Yeah. <laughs> New share. <laughs> yes, we can see your presentation. Yes. It's only it's only how I begin it. It worked. Uh, yesterday. Up, up, up. It, it it will work just just a minute. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> I, why, why is that? This? Oh, yes, 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 good. <laughs> now, uh, well, yes, I, I'm going to, to talk about uh, lingua culture. That is uh, uh, a topic that has interested me for all these years and it's really an intriguing uh, concept, and I, I'm sure we can get many discussions about this. Um, and uh, when I in, in in this in this talk, I will um, I will say something about first about the language culture relation in 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 more uh, general terms, and then I will go on to to explain the uh, transnational view of language that. Uh, is uh, at the basis of my, my ideas of, of lingua culture. And then um, try to define what are the cultural dimensions of language, because I think that normally it is, it is maybe viewed uh, too narrowly. And, uh, and then I will give you some examples of uh, lingua culture in the linguistic system, in the linguistic resources of the individual learner and in linguistic practice. And uh, in the end, uh, I will take up the discussion of uh, or the topic of, of, of discourse and uh, the, uh, the topic of intralingual and translingual discourses flowing uh, around in the world. And uh, in the end, uh, take up the question that is uh, in the presentation, uh, the printed presentation of my, um, of my talk. And uh, uh, that will be an... Um, and input uh, also to the to your discussions. Um, well, uh, when we when we look at the language subjects uh, uh, in general, and and as as you know as um, as practices as as disciplines, they are very broad. And uh, culture in language teaching is a large field. And uh, I have just uh, written a few a few uh, words here, so just to indicate the breadth of uh, what I'm thinking about: knowledge, knowledge, and critical cultural awareness of target language countries. And um, 
their place in the world, geography, history and literature, everyday life, identities, uh, issues and problems, etc. Uh, these uh, topics that I have uh, have uh, analyzed in my book from uh, 2018 about representations of the world in in uh, in language textbooks. So um, all these uh, all these topics are being uh, studied by by um, uh, by social sciences, by humanities, and so on. And uh, but the language culture relation focuses, of course, on the role of language, and is a a topic that is um, studied by the the field the the, the field of, of linguistics or language studies in 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 general. So uh, just just to to emphasize that the cultural side of language uh, or language language studies is much larger than this language culture question. And um, I often, I instead of saying lingua culture, I just say the cultural dimensions of language or the culturality of language. Uh, originally, I all I used the the, the term uh, lingua culture uh, used by the uh, American uh, anthropologist Aga, and I, I also I, I mean I really think that's a, a, a nice word, but I switched to lingua culture because I think that maybe. Maybe it's more familiar in the linguistic uh, context, but uh, I, I mean, for me, these two uh, terms are, are, are synonymous. Um, it, when when we when we you look at how people how people uh, um, talk about language and culture, very often and still today, very often people think about language and culture as something that is inseparable. <clears throat> and I think that that was originally the uh, the idea that um, annoyed me because uh, when we look at the modern uh, uh, world with uh, all these uh, transnational flows of uh, anything from people to ideas and goods and etc., cetera, it, it, it uh, seemed like uh, it, it couldn't be couldn't be uh, tenable as, as it is as such. Um, on the other hand, uh, some people like to say that language is culturally neutral, referring maybe in particular to English as a, as a lingua franca. And, and that as well, I think, uh, even uh, English used as a lingua franca is not culturally neutral. All cultures uh, or all, all languages uh, have cultural dimensions. Um, also, for instance, a, a language like Esperanto that uh, I have been studying as well. So uh, we need a third position. And I think many agree with me uh, that uh, it, it should be a, a position that um, claims that language and culture may indeed be separated in many different respects. But on the other hand, language is not culturally neutral. There are cultural dimensions to any language and that cultural dimension we, we can call lingua culture. Um, and it's, it started for me, it started as a critique and deconstruction of the national paradigm that we all know very well in, in, in the language, um, uh, language studies, uh, the traditional uh, idea of one language, one culture and one nation. And to get out of this idea, to deconstruct it, we have to um, to, to to think about to, to think in transnational terms. And uh, so my my argument in Risa two thousand six and and after that uh, all always start in in this uh, idea of the transnational flows. Um, and here I. I mean, transnational flows uh, is, uh, I, I, um, I was chiefly um, inspired by the work of the American cultural anthropologist uh, Ulf Reinhardt, or oh, Swedish uh, American. And um, he, he developed a social network theory that I think is still very, very good as a background for, for, for our, our work here. 
and uh, he is talking about all kinds of flows, um, flows of people, flows of ideas, flows of different cultural practices, etc. And he does not talk about linguistic flows, but but I do, and I think if if we if we um, um, if we look at, at languages in this way, we can see that um, many of the languages that, are, that we are interested in, uh, larger languages that are taught as foreign or second languages, they, they, uh, they uh, participate in, in global linguistic flows or more or less because now globalization has never been uh, really global and there are some, you know, of course, uh, tendencies of deglobalization and all this discussion we have now. But uh, at any rate, they are transnational, many of them. And uh, we should look at, at uh, most languages of the world as more or less global linguistic flows because people move around in the world. Um, of course, um, uh, mobility. Uh, well, it, it is patterned, but uh, it is uh, very diverse. I mean, some kinds of mobility are voluntary, others are, uh, are forced, some are prohibited. Uh, but um, when people uh, uh, are mobile uh, with the languages that they know, they move from one context, one cultural context to another. So languages may, in this sense, be separated from the cultural context where they, where they flow mo most intensely, one could say. Um, and I think that uh, we should all see our target languages as global phenomena. And uh, when, when we do this, we... Um, we can say that uh, within the within the, the national frames, we have a, a special situation because within the national frames, for instance, French in France or, or etc. Uh, of course, the, the, the linguistic flow flow is is um, is uh, uh, intense, more intense than the outside the target language countries, but. Um, when we look, when we think of it, uh, people who speak, for instance, German, we can find them in most parts of the world, as uh, students, maybe as tourists, as uh, well, all kinds of professions. And uh, even though the uh, period of Corona has has uh, been a, a certain limitation on this, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that also in the future uh, that we will see these um, phenomena of, of uh, mobility. So. Um, um if if we look if we all look at our target languages as global phenomena uh, we can uh, also see, see that well then most of the languages of the world the larger languages uh, uh, they they uh, are also global phenomena so uh, they um, meet or uh, people meet in all kinds of of uh, local um uh, linguistic complexities, and um, one and another point that I want to 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 um, underline is that uh, we should treat uh, all language teachers uh, uh, in 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 an equal on an equal footing. I mean, people who speak the target language as a first language or a second or a foreign language, they are all. They should all be be. Be, be seen as uh, uh, people who uh, have the right to 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 speak and uh, and read the languages they are learning as they do. I mean, um, the, the uh, first language uh, the, or the people who, who who speak the language as a first language do not necessarily well in 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 our in our uh, learning context they should not not have a. Um, a, a first rank. Um, it, it's, it is related to the question, you know, of uh, discussion about who owns the language and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the criticism of the, the native speaker, um, uh, what is it called, uh, priority, etc. So it's, it's just to, to, to um, underline that 
what 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 I am going to speak about now is mostly learners who are learning foreign language or learning languages as, as foreign or second languages. And uh, as I said, uh, yes, we see local linguistic complexities where uh, it's it is not just a matter of diversity, but it's also often a matter of power struggles and hierarchies among these different languages or better between the language users and their social their social statuses and um, possibilities. So if we keep this um, in mind, um, I would like to introduce an imagined example. Think about a cruise ship in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there are lots of passengers, uh, lots of people there. And if we look at the interactions at various tables, uh, we, could, uh, we could observe a lunch table in the uh, restaurant for passengers. We might observe uh, a, a table with uh, people who they may speak English with uh, each other. They may also speak maybe German or I don't know, but uh, and uh, not all of them would uh, speak English or German as uh, first languages, but as second or foreign languages. They have uh, very different uh, linguistic backgrounds coming from many parts of the world and have many language experiences. Um, they would, uh, they would maybe often be middle-aged couples. Uh, they may be, they are rich people. They may be discussing the next ex ex excursion in the next city. Uh, so um, then there, there would be another table at another part of, of, the, of the ship in another part of the ship where some of the crew are uh, are, are lunching and uh, they are they may be talking in in uh, Filipino or Tamil and uh, they would maybe they would be younger than the passengers uh, in and and they would they would be single uh, maybe and maybe they would talk about the uh, photos they have taken of their family their kids back home um so um this is an example of uh, a local complexity. And it's a microcosmos because here we have in the same ship, we have reflections of, uh, of social class, of different uh, ethnicities and nationalities. We, it's also a reflection of world history because the, uh, the distribution of uh, jobs and roles in, in the ship reflect in some way uh, the world's colonial history. And um, so uh, we could say that in this, uh, at, in this um, context, we have a very, a, a linguistically, culturally and socially a very diverse uh, situation. And uh, I, 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 I choose this example because uh, when we are thinking about the relationship between language and culture, uh, very often people, people would say, well, yes, of course, language and culture are, are, are deeply, are intimately connected, but, but, but that depends on the kind of data we usually uh, are looking at. And if, we are, if you are looking at uh, maybe uh, uh, a group of people in, 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 in France who speak French as a native language, uh, a first language, or and, and uh, live in a small town in France and speak about French matters, then it, it would be quite natural that you think, well, language and culture are deep, are deep uh, intimately connected, but you can just look at other situations where that is, is, is not so uh, evident. But on the, on the other hand, I also maintain that all these languages that are used in this situation have cultural dimensions, of course. Um, now, uh, let us just forget th forget this uh, example uh, for a moment and and look at um, 
I would uh, I would distinguish between three kinds of of a loci of language um, uh, for the study of lingua culture. I would say that um, linguistic practice, that is what we have been observing in this imagined uh, situation in the cruise ship. We have, we have seen language communication. We may have seen translanguaging where people are drawing uh, from different languages. We have also seen uh, the reflection of linguistic resources, namely all the more or less plurilingual experiences and competences um, uh, in, in, in the different, uh, in the different uh, people uh, we, have, we have met. And uh, that, yes. And, and then uh, we have also, we have not observed but uh, we know then in, in, in our scientific um, discipline, there is the idea of the linguistic system, English, French, German, and we all know that we can't really um, see uh, this system out in reality, but it is a useful abstraction uh, in order to describe some of the patterns of, of language use. But uh, normally, uh, most, most uh, usually, it's, it's a monolingual abstraction. There may be, of course, um, loan words, but uh, they're mostly treated as, as uh, fully integrated, incorporated in the language or in, in the lexical system. So, so whereas linguistic practice and ling linguistic resources may be, may, may be uh, multilingual, and, and I am looking at them here as naturally multilingual, the linguistic system is a monolingual abstraction. Um, now, I would also introduce uh, three, other, three other factors. They are not, they cut across the three I've just um, uh, presented. Cultural dimensions of language, different kinds of lingua culture. The first one is the one that is uh, most often thought about when, when people think of cultural dimensions of language or lingua culture. That is a semantic, pragmatic, textual uh, side, you know, the um, the content, the semantic content, the concepts and ideas that are, are created are made in our minds, the connotations to words and and expressions and and, and etc. Et the the things that uh, semantics and pragmatics are interested in. But there are two other uh, factors that I think are very important to, to include in this. And one is the poetic, poetic dimension, where we, where we that this is about the, the, the formal, uh, formal side of, of language and its, its uh, relations with, with the meaning side, plays with sounds, syllables, scripts, rhythms, uh, and calligraphy as a, a dimension that is uh, very important in relation to certain languages like Arabic and, and Chinese. And, but uh, but it, 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 it is, uh, I think, also an important um, dimension of lingua culture. And then the third one I would, um, I would um, mention is the identity dimension. Uh, which is also in sociolinguistics called the social meaning. When we are talking, when we are uh, uh, writing, we identify in some ways ourselves or we identify others. And all this uh, play uh, with identities in interaction, uh, uh, which we also do when we uh, choose language. Uh, that is also a, a, a cultural side of, 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 of language. And uh, when I have added here language ideologies, it, it is because identity can also be, be looked at at a more like my, macro level when we are thinking about languages as, as uh, well as, as systems or, uh, you know, attitudes to language, ideologies about specific languages. 
and uh, you know we 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 have or we may have different ideologies about Spanish language and and so on, and this the the, the lingua culture concept I would like it to be a an umbrella concept of all these three, and uh, one can see that uh, during the uh, the last 15, 15 uh, 20 years, more and more people are beginning to 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 um, to, to create la the the, the um, to, to to treat these uh, uh, dimensions uh, in in um, uh, together to see lines between them because they overlap very much, but. But uh, they they have been mostly you know uh, studied in separate disciplines and then these disciplines seem to to um, converge uh, somewhat. And uh, within the, the the field of language teaching and learning, these this it's interesting to see um, how when we, when we think about these three, uh, most people have. Um, have have um, uh, well no no I would I would say uh, when when we as language learners we uh, we approach the semantic pragmatic uh, dimension we 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 don't know the language we we don't know the semantic uh, pragmatic uh, uh, dimensions we have to be told about them or either told or uh, be given good examples or uh, learn about them in conversation it's not it's not it's something new for 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 you and uh, concerning the poetic so so uh, uh, learning the semantic pragmatic side of language is a long process and uh, it's it's uh, becoming much more and more important the more you know of the language but the poetic dimension that meets you immediately when you start. You you start you start with the forms. You start with the sounds, the uh, the script, and so it it comes right from the beginning uh, that the the poetic dimension talks to you. And uh, concerning the identity dimension, uh, learning a, a language as a foreign language put. Uh, uh, puts you in a specific identity position as a foreign foreign speaker. So uh, this is very different different from all the native speakers. You have to struggle with the identity of being a foreign language teacher, maybe speaking the language or writing the language not very well. So um, that has, a, a, I think, a, a deep um, uh, um, influence on, on your identity as, as a language user. Um, yeah. Um, now I, I would uh, go back to these uh, three linguistic system, linguistic practice, linguistic resources, and I'll start in the linguistic system. Um, now here, as I said, uh, we have uh, lots of very interesting studies in anthropological linguistics and intercultural pragmatics and semantics, etc. And uh, the, 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 the discipline cultural linguistics especially has very, very interesting things to, to say. And maybe you know the International Journal of Language and Culture, which uh, contains many um, uh, uh, interesting articles on this. Um, uh, I would especially um, foreground uh, the studies on feelings and emotions and how they are expressed in different languages, how they uh, how they are found in collocational patterns, and and how 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 languages are different as to what kind, what part of the body uh, is the seat of uh, feelings or emotions? Is it the heart? Is it the stomach? Is it the liver? Is it the brain? Uh, that, that may be quite uh, different uh, among languages. And uh, so there are studies about um, uh, feelings like uh, happiness and uh, fear. And of course, now I, I, I mentioned these 
these um, feelings in English. So, uh, but but in other languages, there would be other uh, other um, uh, salient uh, concepts uh, that 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 would be interesting to to compare. So, um, and. Uh, yeah, there's a whole discipline of studies of the keywords in, in, in different languages. So, um, yeah, concepts of the beautiful and the ugly in different languages. And uh, there is also, for instance, a, um, an article of the concept of peace in, in UN peacekeeping missions and uh, how uh, the UN uh, um, central documents uh, contain a concept of peace that may not be uh, be very comparable with the concept of peace in, in different languages and different cultural areas. There are very many metaphors in political discourses. Uh, uh, the nation as a father, the long arm of the law, etc., etc. So. I would point to the importance of metaphor awareness in all language teaching. Uh, now, if we look at all these studies, it is very characteristic that they uh, they look at, uh, they may uh, find data like, uh, you know, proverbs, um, idioms, uh, popular songs uh, and poems, and uh, they are studying language as it is used by first language speakers. It is, uh, they are talking about the salient concepts and key concepts that people in the communities think themselves, uh, they, they themselves think that these are key notions in our, in our uh, community or, or culture. But uh, how is it when you come to a new language and have to learn all this? I would um, now go to lingua culture in the linguistic resources, and I could I could um, I could uh, give you I could uh, present my own lingua culture profile as an example, um, and and I'll start with the languages and then go on with lingua culture reflections. I I started my my first language is Danish, and uh, I learned that as a middle class uh, standard norm speaker in the Copenhagen area, uh, all skills, of course. And then in school, I learned English and from, I think, grade four, I think, and then German, French and Latin. I also um, was aware that Swedish and Norwegian, I, I could read these languages and to a certain extent also uh, understand the, 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 the speak, spoken language because they are neighbor languages to Danish and uh, relatively easy to, 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 to grab with. Uh, I taught myself Dutch um, in school time. Uh, I had a Dutch pen friend and uh, then I studied French and linguistics at the university or skills. And I also, as a part of linguistic studies, I learned some Russian, more Latin and ancient Greek and Sanskrit and Nahuatl and Quechua and Basque, just a little, but just to get an impression of these languages. And then later in life, I have taught myself Spanish and Esperanto. So of course uh, that, that is, a, it, it's clearly a very plurilingual uh, profile. And, um, but what, what I'm, what my, my point is that uh, it is not necessarily as much a plurilingual cultural profile because I, I, I really feel that uh, in, in, in all my language studies and especially when it comes to the later, for instance, Spanish, uh, it, my the lingua cultural profile uh, is more uh, it it is it has started in Danish and Danish lingua culture has been my 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 the, the, the lingua culture of my uh, early childhood and uh, and then of course English and some German and French in in school 
uh, I have also had because I have been reading literature, etc. And but when it comes to ancient Greek, Sanskrit, Nahuatl, and especially Spanish and Esperanto, now these uh, skills are reading skills. I have learned. I have taught myself to read these languages, and it is not. Uh, so I haven't been taught anything about the semantic, you know, traps of uh, going from some languages to Spanish, what uh, f about false friends and so on. So um, I, uh, it, it, when it, it's only reading skills and I haven't been taught, then uh, I, I, I have to discover this myself by reading and reading and reading. And uh, of course, I, I, I try to decenter. And I, well, I, uh, with my knowledge of the world, I can put myself in, 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 in the, the feet of people who, who, who write Spanish. But I'm not, I can't know whether the text in Spanish is made by a, a first language speaker or a second or foreign language speaker. So what kind of lingua culture is behind this text? I could never know, or only if I really <laughs> examined this. So I think my, my idea is that my Danish, original Danish lingua culture, um, or lingua culture, in fact, in influences very much of my, of my other uh, language uh, skills. And um, so, uh, not main, well, I, I have studied French at the university, so there, of course, I, I have also some idea of the semantics and in more depth. But it is not, uh, you, you can't say, well, I know lots of languages, and then I also have a very diverse lingua culture profile. I'm not sure that. Now, um, uh, when, when we look at lingua culture in linguistic practice, uh, let us let us think about this uh, cruise ship again. Uh, how are they combined in these communicative events? I would say you can't say that in advance. The language cultural relation is always an empirical question. You have to see what bits and pieces of language and culture, etc., are combined in this. Uh, situation. Now, uh, if if we if we take this cruise ship, we could also use it as a metaphor for the classroom. Of course, in the classroom, there is a special focus on the target language, but also in the classroom, we can see maybe reflections of class, ethnicity, different language, different uh, languages different first languages, different langu lingua cultures, etc. So, um, yeah. Now, just a, a, a small thing uh, uh, in the end, discourses, because I, you know, discourse is, uh, it is used in many different ways. Now I choose to use discourse in the way that is, it is used among critical discourse analysts like Fairclough and Votak and others. That is, I focus on discourses that are about certain topics or topic areas. <clears throat> so for instance, uh, discourses of food, of, um, of uh, politics, of uh, culture, <laughs> of, um, of uh, news, and um, Discourses also flow about in the world. There are discursive flows, and uh, we can see that some of these fl flows they flow from language community to language community. They, for instance, uh, flows about the news in the world, uh, where there is also a certain pattern, and uh, some view some flows, some news flows are not. Uh, I mean, are. Uh, uh, are not free or not uh, unfree, but uh, many many discourses are translingual. But there may also be discourses that only circulate within a certain language community, and I never, I never do never do never get out for some reason. 
And I think that's also an interesting th uh, thing to, to think about in language teaching. The discourses we are treating, are they just intralingual or are they translingual discursive flows coming from elsewhere and have they been translated or uh, and are they just to mention the 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 very uh, one of the very big questions today uh, are epistemologies uh, uh, carried by by these discourses and to what extent and and so on. So and this makes me makes me uh, underscore that translation is a central lingua cultural activity and should also be a central ling ling uh, lingua cultural awareness in language teaching, not as a skill, not not as not as a routine, uh, but as an awareness of challenges. So uh, in the end, we should keep a transnational perspective on language teaching. And then we should look at the lingua culture profile of the teacher, as I have exemplified, the lingua culture profiles of the students, some of them are doing this in language biographies in, in, in portfolios. And the lingua cultural potentials of materials and activities. What kinds of voices, what kinds of lingua cultures are we allowing in, in, in the classroom? So again, in the classroom, do we see issues of power and hierarchy here? Are there reflections of social class? Are there reflections of world history? So I think the concept of lingua culture may be a, a central concept in the field of, of language teaching. So and these were my suggestions of how we could think about them. So, yeah, <laughs> that was uh, the final words here and my references. And um, now I think uh, maybe I, I should just uh, already here uh, give you my topics for discussion because I think then after then uh, you will be divided up in in uh, in break up rooms and then we afterwards we can discuss together. I would think that it would be interested. It's interesting if you would would uh, discuss what is the role of metaphor awareness in language teaching. I also would like you to discuss, should language teaching include an awareness of lingua cultural challenges of translation? For instance, translation of metaphors. And uh, within the, the short time limit yet that you have, reflect on your own lingua cultural profile. What is the role of your first languages and your own social and cultural biography in all this? Yeah, okay. Okay, I will open the rooms. You will discuss with five or six in your group. Uh, you will have about 15 minutes and then we come back to the plenary and maybe you can report briefly about your discussions, anything you found particularly uh, interesting you want to share, comments, etc. cetera. So uh, I'll open uh, the breakout rooms now. Right. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Hi. Hi, yeah, Sandra. Yeah. Sorry, Helen, mute myself. Um, I joined late because it wouldn't let me uh, join. I had to oh. get in touch with Maria, give me a, a thing. So I missed the very start. Did you want me to uh, join one of the rooms or stay what? out and or so do we? Each go in one of the rooms to have to have a look, or we just you can let if, them be, or <laughs> whatever you want. You can join a group or not. You and should, are you gonna? You should. Uh, I made you a co-host. Can you see the breakout rooms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. So it says I could join any yeah. of them. It gives yeah. me all three of. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So Feel free to join. I'm... 
to go into one and you yeah, yeah, feel free go to into join. one. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's one long um, comment from uh, Carmen there. So I don't know if when we get back, you want to read it out or uh, uh, well, to be we can aware maybe, of. We can maybe share it later on, but uh, okay. I don't know whether it's... Can you right. try to summarize it maybe a little bit or point out the two or three points she wants to make if yeah, possible. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe Karen, if you can read the chat or the comment yeah. that was, you will see yeah. where, whether you can say or want to say anything about this. Uh, but yeah, it's up to you, Sondrine. Uh, yeah, Carmen, yes. So have you started a, a, a timer, Thomas, or you, and you'll be the one telling people to go back to their... No, the breakout rooms... To, will, the, main, uh, no, to, no, to the, the main room. Will you the, be the one locking the... Uh, yes, yes, they will the be... Breakout the breakout rooms, yes. Tom, Thomas. The breakout rooms will close after 50 minutes and the, everybody will see a right. countdown of two minutes okay. before the end. So I think that should be fine. Okay, right. Yes, I'm, I'm reading Carmen's uh, oh, there we go. question. Oh. Yeah. Seems to have gone out. Breakout, one is unassigned part. Yes, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you want, are you going to stay out here, you two? Shall I yes. go into? Yes, I, I, I stay out here, yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'll just uh, I'll I'll join the rooms and just see how things are going or if people need anything. Yeah. Okay. Right. I go. <laughs> I don't. I'm actually not quite sure what Carmen wants to say here because. No. You. Uh, Maybe it's it's about this this the status and role of foreign languages yeah. in different languages in different educational systems and uh, yeah that is of course a relevant um, and that that is uh, related to the the identity question of uh, yeah. what what kind of identity the the foreign language has in in the in the language and in no in in the country in question. Yes, that was yeah. was my thought as well. And obviously, there are power relations and uh, yeah. and sort of different languages of different capital, mm -hmm. uh, cultural mm -hmm. capital, I would say. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. If I may say so, just because I, it made me also think uh, what you said about the, when you briefly mentioned who owns the language, and obviously mm -hmm. the language learner is usually not the one that has the power to make a change or to oh. create new meanings, although we do it and we call it a, as an error, but actually you could see it also just of a new way of using the language, but it's obviously not one that's sort of because of the power relations is accepted or mm -hmm. then transmitted. No. It's, it's it's like the uh, the um, the discussion about the uh, social justice uh, that you, you 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 may you may you may choose an approach uh, that shows respect and uh, recognition, but also being aware that there are inequalities that uh, you can't just get away get away. Yeah. With. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm quite interested actually to build in a discussion with my students of the lingua cultural profile. We will, I'm developing basically a new module. This will, it will be called language engagement in a pluricultural world where I basically want to uh, have all language learners together of different languages. And they will be working on questions, well, they will be learning about 
question of plurilingualism, transnationalism, mm -hmm. uh, transculturality, but also they have to do a plural or lingual project. So they have to work across, uh -huh. and they have to do something that involves more than one language. Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I thought that maybe so to. Uh, oh, hello. I, I just wanted hello. to to apologize because I have another meeting. So thank oh. you very much. Okay. Thank you no so problem. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, was about. Yeah, I was saying that, uh, yeah, so maybe one of the, in the earlier sessions also to make students reflect on their lingua cultural profile to maybe discuss a little bit where they're coming from and what it means mm -hmm. to use different mm -hmm. languages and mm -hmm. what it mm -hmm. might be actually quite, quite a good exercise. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. And that, of course, is, is not, not only uh, the uh, ethnicity and language, but also uh, social social experiences and uh, sort of, uh, as you said but in your own example you made a reflection on your class background and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah i totally agree uh, yeah. particularly in the uk i think where language is well it is everywhere but particularly i think particularly uh, strongly linked to also questions of class and uh, mm -hmm. upbringing or social mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second thing I wanted to say is also personally, as also as a migrant <laughs> and someone uh, who has experienced with different uh, linguistic and cultural contexts, uh, I find it interesting that often coming from outside makes you obviously see things differently, mm -hmm. but also bring different conceptualizations of the social and cultural world and make you or make you see uh, structures or uh, connotations that the so-called first language speakers don't see because they mm -hmm. are often unconscious and implicit, uh, mm -hmm. which where I think actually engaging with the so-called and the so-called foreign actually helps you see yeah. 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 Uh, more about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Right. I'm going into the third breakout. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Reminding them of uh, like how long is left and if they can have like a, a person reporting back. Yeah. Good group. point. Right. Yeah. Uh, are there other chats here? No, not yet. Okay, so mm. we, we yeah. have how many? Yeah. Yeah. Five minutes, a bit more than five minutes. So yeah, yeah. And and we are we are finishing at half past one. Yes, of course. Oh, well, sorry, half past two. Yeah, half it's past half two. past yeah. three in your, on yeah. your side. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so I guess we, we do a round of the groups. Mm -hmm. There are how many? Uh, mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> seven. Mm -hmm. And then we can invite maybe more general comments or questions, or maybe you want to, or if mm -hmm. they have questions to you from the groups, mm -hmm. or you can mm -hmm. comment. Right. I've been to all three rooms and it's all going all right. So I've come out because it, otherwise it feels a little bit like oh, a cool. mag, magpie or whatever, a little spy. <laughs> Are you sure you have only three rooms? Because <laughs> all, all oh, no. is there no are... rooms? No. Oh, that's it. I didn't scroll down. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> all right. No, better go back. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm back. Th there are seven. Yeah. Oh God! Right. Yeah, se yeah. <laughs> seven rooms. It's mm -hmm. uh, about four people ish per room. Mm -hmm. mm. 
And do you have actually any, if I may ask, current projects you work on or do you, are you still involved in teaching as well? Uh, I have just, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I have no teaching uh, for, for the time being, uh, but um, I'm, I'm, I've just uh, finished a book on, or uh, uh, the editing of, of a book on um, the teaching of uh, the Nordic languages in, in, in the Nordic, in the Nordic region, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, um, the teaching of Danish as a foreign language in Iceland. So inter-Nordic uh, okay. uh, edu education, and uh, which is not only about the the languages and the national cultures, but also about the co the concept of the nor as a northern the, the Nordic countries. So there's a political dimension here, mm -hmm. uh, to, to getting aware of northern. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> interesting. If I may say so, at the moment it's very much in fashion, <laughs> the, in the UK. I mean, particularly yeah. Yeah. Denmark. It well, it's been a while. Then Danish, well, more design, but there is this concept of hygge, uh, yeah. which is <laughs> yes. very much in fashion actually in the UK currently. Yeah, yeah, and it's <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh... <laughs> I, I don't I don't know where it stems from. It, well, it, I think it has originated originated a little bit, I think, with food, where sort of also particularly Danish, but generally Scandinavian food came mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. fashion maybe yeah. about five, seven, eight years ago. And then more and more. Yes. And I don't yes. I don't yeah. So yeah, interesting. Right. Yeah, yeah. There is a a, a Dane called Levison who is oh. uh, beginning to be quite known, well known in, in cultural linguistics, who has uh, written a lot about uh, such Danish keywords like hygge, mm -hmm. and, and, and also about the, you know, happiness, because, uh, you know, Danes are said to be one of the most uh, happy people of the world. All so right. He, so he has, he has, uh, he has um, discussed the content of the uh, of, of the happiness concept in Denmark to find out why why this is so. <laughs> okay, interesting. Uh, mm. Well, yeah. lots to think about. I mean, uh, I don't know whether there is also some Brexit related connotation to it, where obviously some orientation yeah. towards Norway yeah. with the country not being part yeah. of the EU. Yeah. But I think the oh, fascination yeah. is wider. Yeah. For instance, I, I for, um, or um, I, I'm just thinking about. Uh, I have just finished something that might interest you. Uh, it is a research timeline in in the journal Language Teaching mm -hmm. about um, about uh, analyzing culture in uh, language textbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, a research timeline uh, covering from the 1960s to uh, to to now, mm -hmm. and giving giving an introduction to the whole field. So yep. it will come out uh, in in a few weeks, I think. Okay, I'll keep an eye on it. That sounds definitely <laughs> interesting. Right. So, yeah, the breakout rooms. Uh, uh we'll close in two minutes so in two minutes or maybe over the next few minutes everybody will will come back Do you know Troy Mac McConaughey? Uh, no. Is that another name? Uh, I, I don't remember where, where he is in, in Britain, but uh, he's, he, he's doing uh, intercultural pragmatics. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he's, on my, he's on my literature list. Okay, Warwick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, no, I have come across him actually. 
now because I have just I see his picture and uh, yeah. yeah. I don't I know how, how how his name is pronounced. Uh, me quite... neither. <laughs> so I... I think that we're almost back together. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, not not quite yet. Okay. A few people have joined, rejoined. Yes, yes. But they are still 27 yeah. minutes. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, Okay, so now I think, yes, everybody will is coming back. Okay. Should, I, should I stop sharing? I mean, all everybody has seen my if, questions. I th if, yeah, I, maybe, maybe, yes, let's. So we have three things. I, I, I stop sharing. No, I don't know. <laughs> I suppose you can leave the questions on. I think it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we can open up. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, we go through the groups. Maybe you want to uh, report anything you discussed, any particular points you find uh, interesting or want to share and or you might also have a question uh, to uh, Karen uh, over to you now I don't have a list actually but Sadia you have yes. already you, <laughs> you saw you, my hand may, I was looking for the um, reactions to find the hand <laughs> so no problem go ahead <laughs> Thank you. Well, we had we had a, a very um, interesting discussion, but we found that each of the three questions that uh, Karen put to us uh, deserve at least an hour, you know, minimum to, to really, um, you know, uh, cover it. But I have I would like to start with a question that I put in um, uh, in the chat to Karen. Um, when and because I put it to the, the other two in the group and they said, well, I think you should ask it and see if what Karen says. Well, Karen, I, I am still uh, struggling with um, um, the, the, the distinction that you said that uh, you can separate culture from, from language. Language does not necessarily, at least this is my understanding of what you said, does not necessarily um, be attached to culture. It can stand on its own. As a practitioner, I find it very difficult to separate the two. Whether the language is your native language or a second language, whatever route you've taken to learn that language, you learned it with its culture. There is a certain amount of culture around it that you carry with you and you transmit. And one example that I have found where culture really is prominent is sometimes my students come to me very proud of what they have written in the target language they use and it's perfect linguistically grammatically everything is perfect and then they say well Sadia what do you think and I say well yeah it looks good but we actually don't say that and then they say but why not it's perfect and I say well because of certain cultural you know concepts and reasons we, it is not it may be correct but it's not appropriate you know in its context mm -hmm. and so I'm finding it myself in my understanding very difficult, if not to say impossible, to separate language from its culture or cultures. Yeah, in, in, really, I, really I, I, I agree with you because uh, my, uh, it was um, uh, important for me to say we, we need to have a position where we say that cult language uh, always has cultural dimensions. And on the other hand, in this more or less globalized world, language uh, use can be uh, transmitted from one cultural context to another because people move around in the world. But uh, your, your point about, about uh, how, how uh, when, when people uh, use the language as a foreign language and then native speakers say, but you have to know that uh, 
it, 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 sh it should be used in this way in order to be, you know, holy uh, as, as we do it. Yes, uh, that is, uh, uh, th that raises, I mean, in some contexts you have to follow norms, of course, but you should also think about the, how other ways of using the language may enrich the target language. Um, so uh, I think we, we should have, on the one hand, we, ha we should have the, the uh, liberty of creativity as foreign language speakers. On the other hand, in some cases, you have to uh, be accordant to, to, to norms and standards because the social context uh, forces you to do this. And there may be exams, there may be all, and in the school system, there are all kinds of, of regulations and, 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 and yes, high stakes exams, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not easy to, 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 to get creativity in. No, no, yeah. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. I think in the end, we do, we do agree. <laughs> We're talking about the same thing, thank you. Right, with regards to the, the points that we discussed, um, the metaphor, uh, we felt that uh, from our own experiences, that this concept can only be uh, taught at um, a higher level, like B2 onwards, you know, probably B1 plus, but it is very difficult to uh, discuss this concept or introduce it at the beginner level, for example, and to teach it. I think because of its, um, um, uh, highly cultural um, element in it because it is very difficult to translate metaphors, you know. Um, and uh, I mentioned an example because yesterday I started uh, with my own B2 French students. Uh, we started talking about politics and uh, uh, talking about how politicians use metaphor and, and other, other rhetorical strategies in, in writing and their speeches. And, um, and then I gave them homework to go for next week uh, with some videos in French and some videos in English, you know, like for Trump and Boris Johnson and Macron and, you know, and then they're going to talk, see if they can find that. So the translation probably would be the translation of concepts and ideas rather than the language itself, because metaphors are just like idiomatic expressions, you know, where you cannot literally, you know, translate. And then the last point, uh, we found it very difficult to to draw our profile because that's a long story, you know, because we all come from different yeah. concept, you know, roots and yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then and, and, and the profile is evolving as well. It yeah. changes yeah. with, you know, the how languages that we've learned evolve and how they change. And so it's a constant uh, recreation, if you like, and, uh, you know, of the profile. So yes, I think, yes, yes. I think my colleagues will tell me whether you've covered everything. I covered everything. I don't know. Yeah. But I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah. I, I, I have a, a comment on, on the concept of metaphor. Um, it, it, it depends a bit on how, how you understand metaphor, because mm -hmm. it, it may be you know, more like a, a rhetorical tool uh, for literature, etc. on the one hand. And uh, in, in, in that case, I would say that 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 I mean, that uh, presupposes uh, some advanced uh, skill of, of reading, but yeah. uh, some, some people in, in linguistics have, uh, have studied metaphors that are all pervading all kinds of talk, uh, like uh, the metaphor of uh, up and down that influences all our, our, our discourse. Um, mm. So, and, and they, but they are very, you know, everyday, discourse uh, or everyday everyday metaphors uh, so this these kinds of metaphors I think could, could, could be introduced very early um, there are some such discourse this metaphors as um, metaphors of the self to, to, to get out of oneself or to pull oneself together and uh, there are so many uh, ways of yeah. uh, concretizing our concepts mm -hmm. so um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's a large subject, in metaphors. Yeah. Thank you. I think Carmen had her hand up, and yeah. someone else on the Emine, I think, as well. So, uh, Carmen I, first. I, I've seen somebody else with the hand up. That wasn't me. That had the hand, the hand up before. Was it? 
but I, I, I cannot see her now. Okay, uh, then I, 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 I'll, I'll talk then, sorry. So, so in our group, uh, we start talking about, for, I think I, I started talking myself and then, you know, everybody chipping a little. So I, I'm gonna say how it started. So for me, this is a bit like the study of literature. I'm, I'm a philologist, so I've, I've done linguistics, history, politics, literature. So from, from a very young age, you know, I'm, I'm a bit old. So, you know, when I was in a school in Spain, when we were like in year one, we started looking at poetry and, 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 and you know, little pieces of literature. And, and always I remember we looked at, well, always not, not so much then, but, you know, as we grew up at the historical context and political context and that kind of thing. And, and I believe that, uh, I mean, and literature, well, is language. So uh, it is always important to be aware of that. Uh, as well as the fact that, for example, in Spanish, uh, well, there is not only one country where, where Spanish is spoken, but, but very many. So, so there are many different characteristics. So uh, the metaphor, um, so Sadia was talking about metaphor, but I think my understanding here, it was not like um, a specific one, like a poetic metaphor, but like more of a general thing, like, you know, and I do believe that that's something that we can create that awareness uh, from the very beginning with A1 students. I mean, I do it myself, you know, mm -hmm. like from any time I can link something we're studying with some saying or some, um, something that is used uh, and, 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 and see some kind of link. Uh, I do it. And another thing that happens when you study a foreign language that doesn't happen in your own language, I mean, a couple of days ago it happened to me in, in Spanish. I don't know what I was talking about with some, some friends, uh, is that when you study a foreign language, you study words in a more literal way. So that's what we need to refrain our students from doing, to take everything so literal. You know, when, when we translate things, we translate meaning. We don't translate uh, words as such, words by, by word. But uh, that, it is important as well uh, from, you know, from the, a different angle, because sometimes uh, when it is our first language, we completely separate the word from the meaning. There is no connection. So we, we think about meaning and there are times that I'm teaching Spanish and then in class through an student afterthought or, or maybe at the time talking about that, I realized it myself, I can see the connection, a literal connection that a word has with another word that I've never realized in, in my first language before. And it, it does happen, you know, in English as well, because sometimes when, when you know, and I believe it will happen in, in, in many languages, uh, I, I tend to, to turn the question if I can, when, when, you know, there is a question like that, I say, but what about this? Think about this in English. And you can see how the student thinks, oh my God, I've never realized that this word had that meaning as well, or, you know, or was related, was linked with this. This word. I cannot give you an example now, but I in believe fact, that in, fact, in your experience, uh, you would yeah. know what I mean. In fact, in, in fact I, I would say because you, you you mentioned many many good examples, and I think uh, mm. maybe there is a need of um, examples of uh, beginners' textbooks that really take up these uh, lingua cultural uh, topics and show how it can be done, mm. because I think that many of these things are, in fact, quite quite simple, but they have to be exemplified and visualized mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and and thematized in, in, in beginners' uh, learning materials. Yeah, yeah, bit, 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 bit by bit, because there are simple, you know, like, like, what do you call it, comparisons, you know, a comparison is a type of metaphor, and that's a very simple thing that you can do from, you know, with complete beginners. Uh, um, but, um, so I think that now I should uh, ask um, the, the the people who were in my in my group to continue because they also they also raised some very interesting interesting points, so, uh, which I I you know uh, I cannot pa pass on properly. Don't, so so don't I worry, would, Kevin. Don't yeah. worry. They may 
come in whenever they want to. We have two questions. I, I think chat. Klaus was there. Klaus and, 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 and Miriam were there. Uh, if, if you could say something too, sorry. Mm. No problem. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting, we have two questions, maybe if I can chip them in. First one from Salva who says, uh, even though you might not, not be a language teacher, what's your view about teaching different dialects or variations of the main standard language? That's sort of one question. And a second question, maybe afterwards, I'll just say it out, uh, read it out because I think it's quite uh, interesting as well. How do you see the concept of plurilingual and pluricultural competence, which was obviously introduced from the CFR uh, recently uh, as being, how is this related to lingua culture? Do you see the, the two synonymous, lingua cultural and plurilingual or not? So two questions, first about the variations and dialects and then about uh, lingua culture, uh, pluriculture, plurilingual. Uh, I, I, well, I, I think uh, that um, uh, it, it should be a part of uh, language awareness teaching. Uh, to, to, to introduce to the, uh, the different uh, large varieties of, of the target language in the world. And, uh, and, and, and then it should be maybe in the introduction of learning materials, it should be uh, explained why, why the, uh, the authors of, of, of this textbook or learning materials, why they have chosen this vari variant and not uh, the others. Because uh, it should not be, for, for instance, for, for, for Spanish, it should not be just without question that you choose uh, Spanish in, in Spain. So uh, it, it, it should be, you know, introduced by some reflections on what, what kind, what variety and also social varieties you, you need. So that, that would be the first question, which is, of course, very, very short. And then the other one. Uh, I'm afraid that I think that in, in these uh, central documents, um, the, um, the relationship between, was it plurilingual, uh, plurilingual competence and, and pluricultural competence, they, they rest on a, an idea that we have language teaching and learning, and then we have culture teaching and learning. And the links between these two are not clarified in, in these um, text so you would you would not know whether some of the pluricultural competence is uh, is lingua culture and how much of it is other kinds of uh, cultural uh, complexity and if you if you uh, if you have this discourse of pluricompetent plurilingual competence plus pluricultural competence then uh, it, there is a danger that you just reflect languages on cultures and say, if we have, uh, I know, uh, seven languages, then we also have seven cultures. So, and, and that would be, I, I would not like, I, I wouldn't like this because that is at odds with the transnational view of cultural flows and uh, language flows. Um, uh, running uh, across cultural contexts. So, but it, it's a very difficult, matter, very difficult question because uh, I'm, I mean, the, it's uh, this general, it is a, a, a key problem in, in the language subject, uh, how you understand this relationship between language and culture, really. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Eleanor. You have your hand yeah, up. I think um, I agree that you know that it's it probably doesn't necessarily address the issue of identification of one target language with one target culture, which unfortunately you see also in the teaching materials very often it's still not challenged. You still have very much a representation in in textbooks um, of one dominant so-called national culture, which mm. would then go against, you know, what, what you're talking about, that basically challenging the national paradigm. It's just, I think it, it, people still talk about language and culture with this idea that, 
it is one language, one culture, this identification mm -hmm. these two. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly, you know, what you what you have said in your publications to try to address that, to try to clarify that actually a language, for example, in clear contexts can be taught. You know, you can teach biology in English, you can teach it in Spanish, you can teach it in other languages. In that context, you're not teaching about culture, and yet you're still using a language. You still might focus on aspects of language, aspects which are linguistics, mm. but you're not actually teaching about a particular culture. On the other hand, it's also the idea that one, you know, even what we might consider a target you know target culture like say let's take Germany there's so many subcultures or it's such a, a cultural hybridity nowadays that if you portray only one view of what the Germans are it doesn't really reflect a modern view of you know the, the cultural makeup of Germany and the same can be said about so many other uh, countries mm, um, yeah yeah I, I, I totally agree and I, and uh, I think you you are you are um... Uh, example of uh, uh, the Clil the Clil situation is a good example of um, of uh, the fact that the language and the, the 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 topical content of the language teaching may be separated and uh, a language may be used for just any kind of topic any kind of discipline. Uh, but on the other hand, the language is not culturally neutral. Uh, it, because if, if if you use English, it would not be exactly the same as using Spanish or Chinese or, but uh, well, it would. And and, and here it, it's it's a question of of translation. What what happens when one uh, translates a, a a text on geography from English to to Chinese? Mm -hmm. uh, some something happens, uh, and uh, that that is the um, yeah. It's uh, there are many challenges. That, so so it's it's not, and and uh, one thing is the, the the translation difficulty, and the other one is the English language has another status in the world than the Chinese language has. So attitudes and ideologies about English. Are very different from those about Chinese. So uh, putting a, a, a kind of a geography uh, a handbook from English to Chinese also changes the whole perspective of the content. Yeah, thank right. you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe um, a quick last comment from Carmen uh, because it's nearly time. Go ahead, Carmen. All right. Well, I was just going to to point out to to the third question we're having here because because that that's pretty telling. I, I guess that in, in a way, looking at that question, the question we were addressing now was was answered because the fact that or, or or cultural, you know, when I think about me, yes, I am Spanish. I speak Spanish, but you know, it's not just that I'm from Spain, I'm from a particular place in Spain, you know, my region. And one thing, one thing, one, one, one thing that came up in, in our discussion was that how in English, for example, in English here in, in, in the UK, uh, there is this very hierarchical, you know, there are lots of, uh, the class system is very, very, very uh, strong. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in Spain, there is, is that class system is, is is a bit different. It's more like you know, or or uh, geographical origin plays plays a more important role with all the different accents that we have. Not so much the class here. The class is, is a stronger thing. And then even within the region, two different cities or or, or towns. Can, can be quite different, can have like different, you know, cultural. Uh, so so that's, that's very important because, you know, individually, many of us will have lots of different, not just one, one culture like that, but quite a few. And mm -hmm. so, or students, and so the people that we are going to be, to be teaching. So it is important for us to be aware of that, but for us to make our students aware of that themselves as well and, and, and perceive these things because uh, may, maybe they you know because sometimes we need to be told about these things to be able to to pay attention to, to them you know de develop that that uh, 
understanding. Yes. Uh, Thank you. And I think that and, was it. And, Sorry. And, and, and textbooks could raise such questions. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And because we need to draw this to a close, I still want to say something I just said to Karen. Uh, in our chat well, during the breakout rooms, this question of class where actually language learning and being open to uh, encounters with different languages, but also different cultures, uh, makes you see things that are often subconscious or implicit in your own uh, culture and opening up to, uh, yeah, uh, meeting uh, different perspectives helps you then see often what is implicit in your own. Uh, lingua there was, culture. There was one more um, oh. kind of uh, point in uh, the chat, which is uh, that basically uh, depending on that each the, or students have their own lingua cultural profiles and that therefore any teaching is really almost negotiated to some extent. It depends what uh, the audience is going to be, what how how things happen or what's discussed or whatever. Uh, and there's one more after that. Oh. Uh, uh, like what, what was was that a question? Uh, no, it was just a, a point made that that's that's what it was that it, it mm. needs mm. to be kind of negotiated. Mm. And then there's one more from Laura. I don't know if you want to take over again, Thomas. And then I think we've definitely gone over, so have to be finished. From from Laura, can you read it, or do you want me to read it? Uh... Well, she, I can briefly say, yeah, she agreed yeah. with uh, this negotiation aspect in the teaching uh, situation where basically uh, different perspectives come together and it's always in a way relative uh, where the teachers come from and the learner comes from. Uh, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry for overrunning a little bit. It's obviously lots of food for thought and there are many, uh, I think, re very relevant questions we uh, can discuss much longer, but we don't have that time today. But there are lots of publications from Karin as well uh, to read more into this if you are interested. And uh, if you are interested in our plans for next year, uh, keep an eye on our our project, we haven't really in the language teaching program uh, finalized the program for the next year, but uh, we'll keep you posted. But for today, I say thank you. Thank you, first and all, foremost to Karen for accepting to- Thank you, thank the you very much. Thanks a lot. It yes. was really yes. thought provoking, I think, and opens up a lot of questions and avenues to uh, delve deeper into.